This morning, we're continuing this series called Classic Rock. We have looked at different song titles from different bands. This morning, I'm doing an obscure band. Well, not obscure, but one that certainly is not as famous as, say, the Beatles or Aerosmith or some of the other ones that we've, uh, that we've talked about. So, um, basically, they wrote this song. Uh, you'll see why. I chose this song. So this morning, we're looking at a band called The Birds. I don't know how many of you heard of them. It's spelled B-Y-R-D-S, The Birds, B-Y-R-D-S. They formed in Los Angeles in 1964. Uh, For those of you who are music buffs, the main thing that you probably would know about The Birds is one of their original founding members was David Crosby, who went on to have a solo career, and he was in Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and all of those kinds of things. So he was an original member, but they were a super turbulent band. By 1968, most of the original members had either quit or been fired. They hired more people. Those people then quit or fired, and by 1973, the band broke up for good. So they were only together for about less than nine years. However, for a short period in the mid-1960s, the Birds were a super, super influential sort of classic rock band. So a lot of these songs, because they were before the era of uh, MTV, there's no videos. I can't show a video, but this one actually could find a live performance of this song by the Birds. So this is Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds. That is the birds with turn, turn, turn. If you haven't already turned there in your Bible, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) This one is self-evident, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Turn there if you haven't already. That song was written for this series. I don't know if David Crosby knows that or not, but (laughs) if any song was ever written for a series called Classic Rock, it's that one. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the next few moments as you have continued to move here among us, have you spoken to us through your word, as you have spoken to us through worship. God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit continue to move here. We long to hear from you. We need to hear from you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. Thousands of years ago, an ancient potentate king called his wisest wise men together, and he said, I want you to compile a book of all the knowledge of the world. He said, "I I want to know everything. Compile a book of all the knowledge of the world. A year later, they came back, and it was volumes and volumes and volumes. And he said, how could I ever know all of this? How could I ever read all of this, let alone know all of this? He said, it's too much. It's too much. I need you to pare it down. I want to know everything, but I I need it to be shorter than this. A year later, they came back, and it was two volumes. And he said, it's still too much. It's still too much. I want to know it all, but I need it to be less following year, they came back with a single piece of paper, and on it was written four words. They handed it to the king, and the piece of paper read, this too shall pass. And they said, that's everything you need to know about the entire world. This too shall pass. That is basically what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, that is basically what Solomon is saying to us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Before we begin this and look at these different times, these different seasons, I want to make this clear. Solomon is not talking about these seasons in the concept of good and evil. For example, that one is positive and one is negative. That's how our brains work because we see everything in terms of black and white. You understand what I'm saying? So we see everything in this and that. So if this is a good thing or if this is a positive thing, then this must be a negative thing. This must be a bad thing. That is not how Solomon is explaining this. I want you to see, what does he say? Look again at three and one. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. So instead of describing these as being positive and negative, he is describing them in the simple terms of opposites, hot and cold. Hot is not necessarily good and cold is not necessarily bad or vice versa. 
Sometimes you need it to be hot. Sometimes you need it to be cold. It's not bad and good. It is simply opposites. That is what Solomon is saying in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I want us to look at these seasons very quickly. So turn back, if you will, to verse 2. Ecclesiastes 3 and 2. Solomon says, There is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. The first thing that Solomon gives us is that there are seasons of life and death. Now, you may say to me right off the bat, you may say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> that, that's definitely a good thing and definitely a bad thing. One of those is definitely positive and one of those is definitely negative. No, they are simply opposites. There is a time for life, but let me tell you something. New seasons of life cannot be attained until we die to some stuff. Okay? So I want you to understand it in that concept. We cannot, you cannot eat meat unless something has died. Now, you may be sitting to yourself saying, well, I'm a vegan, so that doesn't apply to me. You know, yes, it does. I don't know that we have any vegans in Bethlehem, Georgia, but if we do, okay, <laughs> I'm kind of in touch with the reality of my demographics, okay? So I'm not sure we got any vegan, but say we do, and you say, I don't eat any meat, right? Okay, wonderful. But listen to me, the plants that you're eating, they have to be harvested, they have to be cut down. They have to be chopped down so that you can consume. There's a bunch of stuff that God wants to take you to. There's new seasons of life, but those are not possible or attainable without dying to some things. I remember when me and Courtney got married um, more than 24 years ago now. My dad did our wedding. He performed the ceremony, and he sat down with us maybe the day before, or two days before, but right before the wedding, he sat down, just the three of us went to lunch, and he talked to us, primarily to me, because he knew that I was going to be the problem in this marriage. So he talked, to, he talked to us, okay, but primarily to me, and he said to me, Travis, once you get married, things are going to change. You're not, you're not just going to be able to just hang out with your buddies all the time and do all the things you used to do and go all the places you're going to go. He said, you have a new set of priorities and, and, and it's going to be different. I remember sitting at that lunch and thinking, he is so old. He has no idea what he's talking about. He was roughly the same age I am now, by the way. And I remember thinking, how could it possibly change? I'm still going to hang out with my buddies. I'm still going to do all the same stuff that I always did. But listen to me. If you haven't gotten married now I, yet, I have news for you. It all changes. It changes. I had to die to a bunch of stuff in order for the new season of life and marriage to succeed. Death is not bad. Death is not bad. There's stuff that we have to die to in order to move to new levels of life. There is a time to be born. And there is a time to die. And if we do not die to some things, we can never re be, be reborn into new levels of life. Now, next verse, three and three. Solomon says, there is a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. The next set of seasons is building and destruction building and destruction. There are times when, when we have to break down that thing that is killing us. We have to destroy that thing that is killing us. And there are other times when we just need to go somewhere and be healed up. I'd I, I be honest with you, the number of people that come in here and tell me this, and it's not a bad thing at all, they come in here and talk to them, and I say, hey, where'd you come from? Or, or how did you find out about the church and things like that? And they'll inevitably, not always, not everybody, but often, and those of you that have pastored know this, they'll say to me, we just want to come here and be healed up for a little while. We don't want to serve anywhere. We don't want to do anything. We don't want to be involved. We don't want to volunteer. We just need to be somewhere and get healed up for a while. And that's great. That's what the church should be. It should be a hospital for hurting people. There's nothing wrong with that. There are moments where we just have to be healed. We did that in our own life and ministry. We had been really involved at a church. They went through a pastoral transition, and we just felt like that wasn't the church for us anymore. This was years ago when we lived in Florida. And so we just went to a huge mega church in the community. 
And we just sat, oh, they had a balcony, so you could really disappear in a balcony. You can just come in late, and don't even have to come in front. You go up the stairs. Everybody's sitting on the back rows thinking, when are we building a balcony, right? Because you don't have to, (laughs) nobody knows when you show up. You come in late, you go up the stairs, you sit in the balcony. We sat in the balcony, and we just worshiped, and the guy preached, and we didn't serve, and we didn't volunteer, and we didn't do anything for about two years. Because listen to me, there's a time for building up. And there's a time for tearing down. To everything, there is a season. There is, there is a moment where some stuff has to be broken off of your life in order that new things can be built onto your life. Do you see that? that it's not, oh, building up is good, destruction is bad, positive, negative. It is opposites. Some of the stuff has to be chipped off of us. There are things that have attached themselves to us like barnacles on the bottom of a boat. There are things that must be chipped off in order for new stuff to be built on. There's a time of building. There's also a time for destruction. Ecclesiastes 3 and 4. Next verse. A time to mourn, excuse me, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. The next idea of seasons of life is happy and sad. Happy and sad. I've been alive long enough now where I just don't trust anybody that's happy all the time. (laughs) Okay? Something is wrong, right? I just... I've been in ministry long enough where if you're just happy all the time, I have grave concerns about your mental health. We cannot, you say, well, that doesn't seem very Christian-like. It's in the Bible. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. We can't just laugh all the time. There is a time for weeping. It is okay. We in the American church have bought into an unfortunate bill of goods, which is this. Somehow, if we're ever sad, We're like not Christians. It is okay to weep. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be sad at funerals. I have have probably performed now, surely not as many as Pastor Donnie has. He's ahead of me in the number of years of ministry. But I've probably performed more than 100 funerals in my lifetime. And there there is nothing wrong with being sad at a funeral. For those of you who've seen me do funerals, I cry at every funeral I do just about. Mostly because I do the funerals of the people in my church. And I love them. And I miss them terribly. And it is okay to mourn. These, and if you're ever going to do this, it's fine. I'm not picking a fight with anybody on a Sunday morning. But these ones where they're like, oh, we're only going to be happy at this funeral. Because that's what they would have wanted I get that to a degree, but it's okay to be sad when somebody you love dies. You're not compromising your witness to the world. What we are showing them is that we are human. Jesus himself modeled this for us. When his friend Lazarus dies, he shows up three days later. Lazarus has been dead for three days. Martha meets him on the road, and she has all these questions. She has all this stuff that she wants to know. She has all these questions. He... he, he speaks to her about that. We, we, it is okay to be sad with someone you lose. Jesus meets Martha and answers her questions. Jesus meets Mary, and all she can do is weep. And he weeps with her. Jesus wept. If we're supposed to be happy all the time, how come our Messiah wept when his friend died? It is okay to be happy and to be sad. There is a time to mourn and there's a time to laugh. Next, three and five. There's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. This next one, (laughs) the beginning of this verse, look at the beginning of this verse. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. We don't really live in the agrarian society that they lived in 3,000 years ago when Solomon wrote this. So some of the language, the illustrations is lost on us. 
But in looking at commentary and trying to understand this, what Solomon is saying is, if you buy or inherit a field that has never been planted, the first thing you got to do is go through that field and gather up all the rocks and stones so that you can have a nice, clean field to plant your wheat in, for example. Now, if you're mad at someone, if you're angry with someone, you wouldn't gather up stones. What would you do? You would cast away stones primarily into their ground, onto their land. You would gather up the stones in your own land. You would cast away stones onto somebody else's land. Now look how that connects to the rest of the verse. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. The next one is the seasons of relationships and solitude. Relationships and solitude. There is a time where you want the embrace. You want to be around someone. You need to be with friends, with family. You need to be in the presence of other people. There is also a moment to refrain from embracing. It's okay. You have to find solitude. We have, we've learned this in the last 18 months, haven't we? We've learned this, that, that there is no man is an island no man is an island that we need people in our life. We need relationships. We need to connect with people. We need that. But these people that say, oh, I can't be alone. I can never be alone. These people that say, oh, I, um, I, have, to, I have to be in a relationship or I have to have a roommate or something like that. But listen to me. There is a time to refrain from embracing. There is a time where you need to get alone with you and God. Again, Jesus illustrates this for us throughout his ministry. Read the four Gospels. All the time, all the time, all the time. It says Jesus is around the crowds, and they're pulling on him, and they want to be healed, and they want to touch Jesus, and they want to see Jesus, and they want all this stuff. And as soon as, the, as, soon as it's nightfall, what does it almost always say? And Jesus withdraws to what? A lonely place, to a place of solitude. He withdraws to the wilderness, to the desert, just him and God. He understands that there are moments of solitude. If we're always having to be around people, if we're always wanting to be embraced, and then we say to ourselves, why? I never hear from God. God never speaks to me. I don't know what God's saying to me. Maybe it's because we never get alone with him and listen to what he wants to say to us. There is a time to embrace, and there is a time to refrain from embracing. No man is an island. No man is an island. There, there, there are moments where we have to have people in our life. There are other moments where we have to shut off and shut out all the noise and all the folks and get alone with God. Relationships, solitude. Next, look at verse 6. Ephesians 3 and 6, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away. This is, I wish he was still here so I could tease him. Many of you remember Pastor Chris, Chris Russo that was here, long time. He's pastoring another church in Atlanta now. I love Chris. We had a great relationship. He was one of my favorite people I've ever done ministry with. And me and Chris were almost diametrically opposed in everything that you could ever think of or imagine. <laughs> Primarily diametrically opposed in the concept of what we needed to hold on to, and what we needed to throw away. I am a big believer in getting a dumpster every six months and putting everything we hadn't used in that dumpster. Chris was a big believer in the idea that this tiny piece of drywall we might need again in the future. And I was like, Chris, we can buy a huge sheet of drywall. And he's like, oh, you never know, Pastor. We might have a hole exactly this size and we can just put the drywall right in it and we wouldn't have to cut it. And me and Chris would duke it out on, ch on church work day over what was going in the dumpster and what wasn't. Listen to me. There are seasons of life. There are seasons where we hold on and there are seasons where we let go. And it is important to remember this. This is a, one of the most important things. You hold on to everything for too long and you've got no more room for God to give you anything new. The most, the most, the scariest television program 
ever created is a show called Hoarders. Ha ha ha! I have shared this before, but my OCD, I literally cannot watch that show. It makes my skin crawl. There was one where a woman's basement was so full of stuff that a homeless guy had broken into the backside of the basement and was living in her basement. (sighs) Ask Courtney if the milk sits out for 15 seconds, I'm putting it back in the fridge. Like, hey, we can't leave the milk sitting out. She's like, it was 10 seconds, Travis. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Next thing you know, we got a homeless guy living in the basement, (laughs) right? (laughs) Listen to me. (laughs) There's stuff, there's stuff you got to hold on to. There's things you got to hold on to, but there are other seasons of time where glory to God, you got to let it go. And you got to know the difference. Hold on to old pictures. Throw away old bank statements. All right? There's stuff you hold on to, and there's stuff you just throw away. And you've got to know the difference. Allow God to work. That See, that that, that pain, right? That thing that was done to us. We like holding on to that because it gives us the moral high ground. It gives us the spiritual superiority over the person that did that to us. I'm not letting that go. I'm not forgiving that person. I'm holding on to that. And then every time I see them, they know I'm better than them and I know I'm better than them. Listen to me. You got to let that go. Hold on to these things. Hold on to the fact that Jesus loves you. Hold on to the fact that Christ died for you. Hold on to the fact that you're a child of God. Hold on to the fact that you've been created for a purpose and a destiny and a calling. But the pain of our past, the unforgiveness, the anger, the rage, let it go. Otherwise, we find ourselves living in spiritual houses that are full of stuff that is killing us. We cannot, we must not become spiritual hoarders. Some stuff we hold on to, but there's a season to let other stuff go. Now, Ecclesiastes 3 and 7. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Again, we don't quite understand the analogies that Solomon is making in this. A time to tear and a time to sow. When would they tear their clothes? When they were sad. When they were in mourning. When someone that they loved had died, they would rend their garments. They would tear their clothes. When that period of mourning was over, they didn't have the financial ability to buy new clothes. They would have to sew them back up. Look at the second part of the verse. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. This next season of time is the difference between sorrow and comfort. The opposites, the seasons of sorrow and comfort. There are some moments, there are some times, and this is important for us to learn as we relate to other people, and this is something I have had to learn. There are people that say they want, oh, I need some counseling. Pastor, I need, to, I need to talk with you. I need to speak to you. I need your advice on this thing or that thing. They come into my office. They don't actually want advice. They don't actually want me to talk. You know what they want to do? They just want to talk. They just want to let it go. They just want to get it out there. They've gone through a difficult time. They're in sorrow, and they are wanting to just talk to somebody. What they don't want is any advice from me, right? I've learned my job in pastoral counseling, all I have to do is be a good listener. That's what I've learned. That's all you got to do is be a good listener. Most people don't want your advice, and even if you give it to them, most of them aren't going to take it anyway. Just be a good listener. We have to learn that in our own interpersonal relationships with each other. This is, this is important for This is important for those of us who are married or in relationships or dating or engaged. Primarily, I know this isn't a marriage conference, but primarily men are fixers. Primarily, we fix the problem, right? Women, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, women are processors. They want to process what has happened. Do you see that those are things on opposite track running? You understand? 
Because the woman says, hey, this thing, I want to talk about this thing that happened. And the guy says, hey, how do I fix it? How do I do this? How do I do that? She doesn't want you to fix it. She just wants you to listen to her process it. I just saved you from going to divorce court, if you will listen to me. Okay? Any of you that just got married, sometimes you just can't fix it. She just wants you to listen. What does Solomon himself look back again? A time to keep silent and a time to speak. What is this opposite? It is the opposite between sorrow and comfort. It is the opposite between sorrow and comfort. Sometimes they want to, sometimes they just want to cry. They just sorrow. We talked about this with Mary and Martha, and it works for this as well. Martha wanted to be comforted. Martha wanted to be comforted. She had questions. She wanted answers. Mary wanted, she just wanted Jesus to wrap his arms around her. Jesus didn't say a word. He wrapped his arms around her and she just cried on his shoulder. If someone is, is mourning, is in sorrow, understand whether it's a time to be quiet or a time to speak. There's a difference. Finally, look at 3 and 8. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. I want to make it clear, I do not believe that Solomon is telling us that it's okay to hate. Again, we have to be able to understand he's talking about seasons of time. But there is this opposite, and this final opposite is between love and hatred. Love and hatred. And you say, well, well how does hatred work in the life of a believer. It works like this. There has to be a moment, there has to be, there must be a moment where we, we hate this thing that we have become, this thing that we've allowed to be in charge of us. You, you never experience spiritual moments of love and peace if you are not willing to fight the thing that is killing you. You have to do that. There has to be a moment where you wake up and you have this moment of clarity and you say, I hate what I have become. I hate what I am doing. I hate the way that I'm living my life and I'm unwilling to live it this way any longer. Seasons and moments and times of hate do not lead to more hatred. They lead to levels of love and peace. And as we experience that love and peace, then God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, says, what about this thing that's still in your life? What about that thing that we haven't dealt with? And so we hate that thing, and we fight that thing, and we kill that thing, and that moves us to a new, even better level of peace and love. And then Jesus challenges us again, and we hate it, and we fight it, and we move into more peace and love. That hate, Seasons of hatred don't lead to seasons of more hatred. They lead to seasons of peace and love, but we have to come to a point where we hate that thing enough to destroy it and to fight it so that we can inherit a season of peace and love. There is a time to love, and there's a time to hate. There is a time of war, and there's a time of peace. We have to get angry and hate the things that are keeping us in bondage. So Solomon gives us all these things. He says, to everything there's a season. There is a time and a purpose for everything under the sun. And he gives us all these opposites. Now I want you to see how he sums it up. Look at Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. Look at the first part. He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Ooh, that's a challenging verse. Because there are a whole bunch of seasons of life where it doesn't look particularly beautiful to me. But that is a wonderfully radical New Testament truth. He has made everything beautiful in its time. What is Solomon telling us? He is telling us this, that we need to trust God in every season of life. In the time of this, in the time of that, in a time of building, in a time of destruction, in a time to hold on, in a time to let go, in a time of happiness, in a time of sadness and sorrow and comfort, there is seasons of life and seasons of time, and we trust God in every season. That verse, by the way, is a wonderfully awesome New Testament-type verse. 
You probably know this, but turn, if you will, to Romans 8 and 28. You know this verse, but I want you to see how this connects to what Solomon wrote a thousand years before this was written, right? And 3,000 years ago, a thousand years before Romans was written, Solomon, think about what he just told us. Everything is beautiful. Now look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, all seasons, all times, all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Everything is beautiful in its time. We trust God in every season because he is sovereign over it all. He knows it all. He controls it all. He is sovereign in all things, and we can trust him. It is not, it is difficult to say to someone who is sad that everything is beautiful in its time. But Solomon tells us everything serves a purpose. There is a time and a season and a purpose for everything under the sun. So let me close with this. As I have said before, Probably my favorite author and my favorite set of books is, is my favorite author is J.R.R. Tolkien. My favorite set of books is his Lord of the Rings books, and he wrote a ton of other stuff. An incredibly talented, creative guy, also a, a wonderfully devout Christian. A, a really amazing human being and an amazing life of Tolkien. In his sort of most well-known book, The Lord of the Rings. There is this part where evil has returned to the world. The dark is rising. This ring that holds all of the evil in it must be destroyed. That's the purpose. These two characters are talking. One character says, I wish that this had not happened in my time. He says, I wish this all of this bad stuff hadn't happened while I was alive. I wish this had not happened in my time. And the other character says, so do I, and so do all who live to see such times. He says, but that is not for us to decide. What we must decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. What we must decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I wish that I did not live in this time. I could have lived my whole life and been perfectly happy with not going through the last 18 months. I'll be real honest with you. I would have been fine with that. Think about how long human beings have been on the earth and all of us have had the privilege to be alive for the last 18 months. That doesn't feel like much of a privilege. I wouldn't have chosen this time. That's not for me to decide. All I can decide is what to do with the time that is given to me. You say, I wish I didn't live through this time of mourning. Yes, but that's not it. That's not for us to decide. What to decide is what we do with that season of mourning. What we do is decide of that season of destruction. What we do is decide what we do with that season of sadness. None of them, Solomon does not present a single one of these seasons in the context of being negative. He simply says, Everything under the sun has a purpose. Everything under the sun has a reason. And furthermore, he tells us, everything is beautiful in its time. Do we want and wish for different times? Sure we do. That's not up to us. What we can do is listen to God, allow him to speak to us, and let him work in us and through us in the season of time that we find ourselves in. To everything, there is a purpose. To everything, there is a season. There is a purpose. No matter what season of time you find yourself in, God has a purpose for you in it. And it is beautiful. And all things work together for good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, this wonderful day to just gather in your presence to experience your Holy Spirit working in all of us, speaking to each of us, moving in us corporately. We worship you. We thank you. We praise your holy name. God, I ask that you would finish this simple teaching in the hearts of every person. 
whatever season they are going through. We know this. It is beautiful. All things work together for good. We also hold on to this. That season, this too shall pass. We know this. So help us, God, to learn, to show us what you would have us to see, what you would have us to learn in these seasons. No matter what season, each person unique and unique with the season they're dealing with. Speak to us. You have a purpose for each of us in every season we find ourselves in. Show us, speak to us, work through us and in us. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Everything has a season. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful week.